program, we are expanding into Black expats worldwide. That's right. So we'll be going to um, uh, Belize. I have a trip going to Belize in July, and um, we're going to um, um, you know Costa Rica and places like that too. So it just kind of evolved. You know, everything about me is very organic. Mm -hmm. I don't have a business plan. Never had. Yeah, that's great. This page has been a great resource for me. It's been great meeting you on there and meeting a bunch of other people, probably some of the people that uh, subscribe to our channel, maybe watching mm -hmm. right now. Looking forward to meeting more of you all. And um, yeah, I remember that first video when I found your page, it was like uh, your Brisa Del Golf Norte video, the first one, you know, um, that's on your YouTube um, channel. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, man, you know, this is some good information here. So it's, it's been good to interact with everyone. Uh, on there so thank you for starting that page has been great it's going to continue to be great for everybody yes thank you uh, thank you for your contributions um i always tell people about uh, your channel because i just think you do an excellent job i really do and i you know i tell you that to your face and i tell you that i tell people that behind your back thank you so much I pray, <laughs> I pray, you know just uh thirst for knowledge you know i just feel like if you're going to go live in a country um, you really need to go research it and find out as much as you can about it, you know, because you're going to get blindsided with stuff no matter what happens, right? Because nothing's ever going to go perfect, but I might as well try to keep that to a minimum, you know, if I can find out as much as I can, as soon as I can, right? So that's Absolutely. the way I operate. You know? Absolutely. I think it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and so thank you for the information you're putting out. And then these interviews, um, we probably started doing these around the same time. Of course, you're cranking them out a lot faster than I am. But I remember like your interview, um, thanks, by the way, for your shout out. Uh, shout out you gave us on your video with, uh, uh, is it Udena? Orena. Uh, yes. Orena. Yes. The queen, baby. Queen. Yeah, thanks. Yes. For that, uh, <laughs> that one. And then the video uh, with Yadira. Uh, much needed information there. Uh -huh. Health insurance yes. and all of that is great information. So thanks for everything. Yes. And what we try to do too is um, we try to promote as many Afro Panamanians as we can and also to connect the uh, connect our group to Afro Panamanian uh, social movements mm -hmm. and, and civ uh, civic uh, organizations. And so that's a thing too. My thing is this when you know, I've been on the other side of the whole foreigner thing forever. So I've never been a foreigner because I've always just been in my country, right? And you would hear people talk about, you know, these foreigners come here, they buy up all this stuff and they get all this, you know, what about us and, and different things like that. I think that from a foreigner's perspective now, I see life a little different. And the thing is, is that when people come from something different, the things that we see every day and walk by as if we don't see them are opportunities for That's them. Right. They are willing to live 10 in a house till they get their stuff together, you know, mm -hmm. and can, you know, take turns buying houses and things like that. And they take advantage of stuff that we miss just because of like nose blind, I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's the yeah, stuff that yeah. you just see every day and you see so much you don't see no more. But when you come to Panama, there are so many opportunities for business, for relationships, and most importantly, there are so many opportunities to give back. That's right. I think that Panama has a lot to give and, and I have actually benefited a lot from being here. So I just started reaching out to Afro-Panamanian organizations. That's how I get so many or interviews with them because I've reached out to them and said, hey, how can I help? I put them together with a, um, a free flow, a nonprofit organization in, out of Northern Virginia and they ship just like, you know, tons of sanitary products for women and everything to Panama. Panama during the pandemic when you don't think about those kind of things and we've just been able to collaborate on so many things. I'm going to be doing training. Um, I'm going to be training um, Afro Panamanian natural hairstylists to do better business so that they can compete with foreigners who are coming in that are a little more polished when it comes to the customer um, service. And so I like for, that we can give back as opposed to just come and take everything that we can. 
That is one of the goals of our, um, yeah, that's one of the goals of our channel as well. You know, that I state on our, like our opening video when you go to our page, which is, is basically like not just being foreigners coming to a country, everything you just said not just being foreigners coming to a country or foreigners living in a country, but becoming, even though you may not be official citizens of the country, but becoming like citizens of the community and helping people and yes. contributing where you can, because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take as much as people think, you know, like you said, a small thing you can do may help out a lot of people in a place like Panama, you know, yes. whereas, you know, it may be an ordeal to try to do it in the U S yes. um, so it's definitely at the top of our list too. And then at the same yeah. time, you can help them grow businesses. We can grow our own businesses. And um, so it's just a perfect storm uh, of everything coming together. And then by helping people, by helping others, hey, you know, it's yeah. just my personal thing. You know, we all be blessed for doing that. Just helping yes. each other out. And, um, I, and I absolutely, totally agree with that. And um, even like in the States, people that know me personally, I've been doing this thing called Buy Black Fridays for probably about six or so years. And it just used to be, I would only spend money with the black, with black business owners and vendors on Friday. And it's just one day, but if, if, if Target and Walmart and all these other stores that you're giving all this money to look up on one day and say, where is our money? And then they find out, wow, the blacks are withholding their money. I feel like our power is in our economics and, and, and that for blacks to be in the United States and being treated so, you know, so unfairly. I mean, you know, right now it is just like, bam, it is just in your face. You would have to be absolutely deaf, dumb, and blind to not be able to see, you know, the things that are going on. And then you think about all the wealth that we bring to that country. You think about all the money that we have collectively and you say, you know what? I could probably live better than this for about a third of the money in some place where somebody's going to appreciate my money and I don't have to be worried about being constantly targeted just because I'm black. That's right. And so it, I think the one good thing that is happening is that we are starting to embrace each other more even as North Americans, mm -hmm. because it is something that we've been missing. But I think it's something that we have been kind of slow to, to you know, since uh, desegregation, really, um, that we have been kind of slow to embrace. I think that when we go to other places, that's something that, that's something we can bring. That's you know, we can bring, hey, I'm here to support you, you know, and different pe black people in Panama perceive themselves as different sometimes, you know, uh, black uh, Northern North Americans, uh, people from the United States perceive ourselves and how blacks in other countries perceive themselves is different. So sometimes it's like a fine line and you got to respect whatever that line is. That's right. But more and more in Panama, the, um, they are talking about, you know, the, the fact that they're Afro-Panamanians and, 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 and you could see it. Can I tell you this real fast? What? Okay. okay. So when I first started coming to Panama, everything was white. I kid you not. You couldn't find nothing in the store that had a black face on it. That was 2004. So I used to, I'm an entrepreneur. So I've done things where I have a sister-in-law here who is just like amazing. She can make anything. And just to give you an example how things were going in Panama. She made these, uh, this, this hanger where you could put your bags, you know, those things you could put your plastic bags in. She had a little face, a little dial face in the bag, looked like a dress. And it was white. And I was just saying, now my people are black. You know, my husband is an Afro-Panamanian. And I was like, that is so cute. And I said, but what? do you have any black ones? And she just looked at me like, what for? Yeah, like, like nothing is wrong, right? Yeah. Yes. And I was like, I would never put anything like that in my house. You know, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not saying that I'm, I mean, I just wouldn't. You know, I think that, I think black is beautiful. And I, I want something that represents me in my house. I said, do you think we could try to make some with a black face? She was like, I guess so. <laughs> so we went into the store, got some brown fabrics and some African cloth and made some just for me. That's you know, right. I sold them. But that was the mentality. So when, but as time has started to, you know, move on, and even when I decided to bring sister locks to Panama, you know, I knew when I went to for my training on Sister Locks in 2012 that I was moving to Panama at some point and I needed to do something that wasn't going to require my raggedy Spanish, okay, mm -hmm. too much. And so I decided to learn how to do Sister Locks. 
And the reason I did that was because um, the sisters was not being served here in, in Panama City for their hair. Their perms was like, is it or is it not? You know, the, the weave hair or whatever they was doing was like, I don't know. You know, we got V-Girl now, you know, and that's it. things have changed and things have evolved. And I had bet on things changing and evolving. And that is what Panama is in the process of doing. They have this big celebration in May at Mia Negra, you know, and these communities of Afro-Panamanians who are making strides to build up the pride and just the, the awareness of the Afro side of the Panamanian, and I'm with it. Yeah, that all sounds great. And that's uh, some of the same stuff we covered in our interview with um, with V-Girl, with um, Vanessa. Or Vanessa. Um, mm -hmm. And she mentioned some of that same thing. And uh, also on our interview with Virgil Blades, he's a realtor. He's a native Panamanian also. So that, yes. what they were both kind of saying is that, you know, Panamanians kind of see themselves first as Panamanians from a cultural mm -hmm. standpoint. It's not necessarily like racial lines divided unlike in the u.s where that's race is always at the forefront so for them is more so first about you know being panamanian but there's still nothing wrong with being proud of who you are in terms of being black but you still can also still be proud of being a panamanian at the same time but that's the part of it that you know we kind of work we're kind of working on that but um and I mean, and we've been we've been through a process too. I mean, just think of all the ways that blacks have identified themselves over the last few decades. Oh yeah. And even some, you got some blacks that don't want to be be referred to as African American. You got some blacks that don't want to be referred to as Black American. I'm just American, okay? You know, <laughs> do you? Um, but when it comes to Panama, you know, me being an outsider, here's the thing. You know, Virgil and Vanessa, they know a lot more than I do. Um, I have really been spent most of my time here in Panama over the last, I guess, almost two years now um, since we've been here more permanently. But I spend so much time checking myself. I'm just going to be honest with you, Alonzo. I spend so much time checking myself to make sure that what I'm feeling is not just what I'm used to a reaction to what I'm used to experiencing in America. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I try to not go straight for the, oh, it's because I'm black thing. Mm -hmm. because I realize that it's not always the case. And a lot of times, and it's something you can't explain, but as a black person, I think most people will understand what I'm saying. Some stuff you just know. You know what I'm saying? It's like some stuff you just know. And so I've tried to give people the benefit of the doubt here in Panama. And I think that whereas my experience may um, be different is that I don't speak Spanish. So, and, I, and the Spanish that I speak is not very good. And I think that some of the cold shoulder that I get is more about that than about the color of my skin. Honestly, I do. And um, I feel like there is racism here, um, as is everywhere. Um, sometime I go into this Reba Smith over here at Brisa de Golf, and I feel that. I feel like there are some Panamanians that you know, feel like, you know, these blacks are coming over here with all this money and you know, we working for them now. I don't think, you know, and I really feel like sometimes it's I really feel that sometimes, but not like I do in the United States. And I have to give them the benefit of the doubt because when they don't speak English, I'm a hard customer. They don't want to fool with me. Right. It's too much work. It's too much work. And especially because they say I look like I'm from Cologne. They but always it's say that. Yeah, because I'm black. They yeah, always say that. <laughs> You from Carlo? No, Jersey. But um, I think for me, it's hard to tell. My husband picks it up, you know, and he senses it sometimes, the, the, the racism um, towards him, because he get people right together. And for him, I think it's, he's much more open-minded, and my husband is much more worldly and uh, much more diplomatic. Um, than I am. And so when I feel him feeling that way, I know there, there must be something, you know, to yeah. what he's saying. But some of it, I think we got to take a second and check ourselves 
because of our history, you know, and because of what we're used to. And it's not, it's not always going to be that way. Right. Yeah, we have to let our guard down a little bit. You know, and um, this other thing that um, Vanessa mentioned, you know, like leave the PTS, PTSD at, at back in the U.S. You know, yes. post traumatic stress. Yes. And just come and just try to relax. Now, when you mentioned about as far as like checking yourself and like you maybe feel some kind of tension there or whatever with some of the uh, the people, like say at the Reba Smith and stuff like that. So my limited experience and what I've heard others say is that is more so like classism in Panama, more so than racism. So, you know, anytime you got like an uneven distribution of wealth within a country, you know, you're going to have some classism. So it's like people maybe looking at you a certain way because you have maybe some money or some advantages that they don't. Mm -hmm. And may or may not be racism. It may be more classism. So we just got to always be aware of that also. I, I do. I, I, and you can feel that too. Like I said, in Reba, sometimes I feel like it's like the, the, the feel that I get is these Blacks coming over here with all this money. And in Brisa the Gulf Norte, we have a generous um, uh, population of Blacks from North America. You know, it's wonderful to be out, you know, and um, it's wonderful to be out. I think the thing that brings people here is the military. The military members like living here, and um, and I like having them here. And I, I, ain't, I ain't even gonna lie, I have an agenda. I want more of my neighbors um, to look like me. Um, full disclosure, the neighborhood that I live in right now has a lot of Chinese people um, in it, which, you know, I, I ain't got no problem with that. As long as you paint your house, right. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? But we get having an issue with that, but the good thing about the communities around here too, is we have HOAs. And they just, and can I tell you something real funny about the HOAs? Yes, it's gonna crack you up. When you, when you roll and you ain't paid your bill, they will put your name at the front gate and at the, uh, uh, at the clubhouse where you go to the pool and everything, they put your house number, they put how much you owe, <laughs> they will shame you, yes. And so now we got some situations where people haven't been painting. So Alfredo just got an um, email yesterday and they was like, look, if you don't paint your house, your remote is going to be um, revoked. You're going to have to come through the visitor line anytime you come to your house. Yeah. Um, not only that, baby, you ain't allowed to have no visitors. Oh, <laughs> no, that's a problem right there. This could never happen in the United States. You're not allowed to have visitors and you're not allowed to have deliveries come to your house until you get No to Amazon? Mm-mm. No, uh -uh. <laughs> you can't have no food delivered or nothing until you get yourself together, paint your house, or pay your bill. Um, so, but I feel that because HOA might be a little bit of a novice thing, I don't think it was as popular as it is now because now you got Panamanians, you know, uh, walking dogs with bags and stuff like that. And it wasn't that organized in the past, but that's how they go. That's how they finna deal with that. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So one of my other questions was based, and you already hit on some of it, but I was going to ask how expats are treated in Panama and more specifically, black expats, you know, what's the racial and social climate like there? You already addressed some of that, but I didn't know if you had anything else maybe to add to that as far as like how expats are treated. Um, no, mm -mm, no, not, not really. Um, I think yeah, I, I pretty much hit on everything that, that from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I mean, I, I like I like being here. I feel welcome for the most part. I remember, but I'm gonna tell you something, Alonzo. That has improved over the years. That has improved over the years because initially when I came here, I used to hate to go to the stores and they would tell me. I mean, do you can were you coming here back when they used to do that? I mean, they was like somebody would tell you, and I'm like, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Because normally in the States, if somebody's doing that, they asking you if you need help. No, nah, you just telling me, you know, and then when you touch something or move it, they fix it. That used to drive me bananas. And they don't do that much. They don't do stuff like that as much anymore. And they now almost every store has somebody in it that speaks English. 
So if they come up to you, their customer service is getting a lot better. If they come up to you and then they realize that you speak um, or you ask them something, they realize that you don't speak good Spanish, they say, okay, wait, but it used to didn't be like that. They would just walk away from you, you know? So I've seen a lot of improvement with the tourist because Panama became so touristy. And I think that that's when people, when, when they started shifting, like we're gonna have to do better because these foreign companies are coming in here and killing us, you know, or these, you know, North Americans are coming and they're not coming back because you treated them so horribly right. based right. on how we perceive treatment should be because the whole customer service mentality here is different. Yeah, they do need to work on that. So that's one thing that I think Joyce mentioned in our interview with her. That, that was one of her top negatives was customer service. Customer service. And I, you know what, I guess it, if I had a thought of that one, it would be too. And, you know, I think about me and I've had somebody ask me this before. Um, the company that I work with, the destination management company, ITA Global, that is not an all black company. It's like um, three dudes that one is white. One is a, a brown Nicaraguan and one of them is a black Nicaraguan. And so it's a nice diverse group. But when I first met him, I met the white guy from Arizona. And when I tell you Chris Pugh is everything and all that, but I wasn't looking for him. I was looking for a black company, a black tour company to host 40 African-American sisters. Um, Sister Lock in Panama 2020, I brought 40 sisters here to Panama. And when I tell you, I have re recommendations to two black, well, one black, one brown tour companies. And when I tell you the treatment that they gave me was, look at here, l l let's be clear. Let's, let's be perfectly clear. Um, I am all about black business and supporting black business. But at the end of the day, you're not gonna disrespect my great. That's what we're not finna do. And so what ended up happening was that I had to go out publicly. And when these two owners, I mean, you was talking thousands and thousands of dollars, right? And these two owners basically gave me their butt to kiss as if I was doing them a favor by letting me, you know, talk to them. And uh, that's just not the way I operate. So when I put it out there publicly, Krista Pugh is the one that that uh, I got a lot of feedback from the white tour companies, okay? And I was surprised how competitive it was at that time because the companies that I reached out to didn't give me no respect, you know? But Chris Pugh was the one that get, left me a voice message. And I heard his voice and I said, he sounded like he might be about something. And when I tell you, that's my boy. And when I tell you, when I come to Panama, I'm taking my group to the uh, West Indian Museum. So whatever your little city tour is, we need to fix it. So we doing that. Oh my God, my man got me all black vendors. You know what I mean? He, he bought in to what it was that I was looking for. And he has been just like one of my best friends and my best, the best, we end up becoming business partners. That's great. You know, it's a beautiful thing. But like I said, you, the customer service, you got to come up on that because these foreigners will come and put you out of business. Believe me, you know? So that's how I ended up with my man. Well, at least you found one good gym out there. You know, it may be a lot of people that's not, um, well, customer service not up to par and they went up to serving your needs, but hey, you found that one good one and that's really all you need, right? That's it. And I said, that's my boy. That's it. You know, I, I do business with other people or other things, but as far as what me and Chris do, we're exclusive. That's my man. That I'm telling you, he has just done that much. He's excellent. And that's what I'm about, you know, so we're just you know, expanding and uh, bringing, trying to bring more, you know, black businesses into the fold, but that's my man. So that's one other question I had for you was about your Black Expats Explore Panama tour. So, you know, I think just through normal conversation, we're hitting a lot of these questions that I had planned to ask you. <laughs> but I'm I trying not to talk too much. I'm trying to give you your space, Alonzo, to cut me off because you know I can talk a lot. No, uh, this is me interviewing you. So the people want to hear you. You know, they hear me all the time. <laughs> so, I mean, on this channel, they hear me all the time. So they want to hear you. But um, I don't know if you had anything more to add on the Black Expats Explore Panama tour. Like, how can they get in touch with you to book? 
you know, what is, what's the next tour that's set up, you know? And, okay. Yeah. The, um, so we, we opened up one tour and we're going to do it. It's a taste Panama type thing. Mm -hmm. Um, we are staying closer to the city. Um, uh, but during that it's five days and during that five days, you're going to get to see, um, first of all, the West Indian museum, because anybody coming to Panama with me got to see that the West Indian Museum, uh, but you're also gonna get to see what it's like to live in suburban areas. Of course, you know, Greece, I'm gonna go off more tight, that's one of my ways. Suburban time. areas, um, uh, areas at the beach and areas in the mountain. And we're gonna do all that in close proximity of Panama City. And that's that's kind of how we're gonna do it. And we're gonna do it, we're gonna be here doing uh, in Negra. So we just got a lot of stuff, you know, planned that we're gonna fit into those five days. And so we had that trip, that trip sold out quickly. We only allow like 30. Um, on each trip because we wanted to still be, you know, intimate and, and you know, and, and good. And plus, we need to be careful with crowd sizes because COVID is still very fluid. Yes. And yes. so, but we added another one. We had so many people on the wait list that we added another trip between May 28th and June 1st. And we're going to be um, doing basically um, the same thing. And we still have nine seats available for that. You can find um, that link. I'll give you the link to put, put here. It's like um, the link for the trip. You can also become a member of our Black Expats in Panama group to get updates and to meet, um, you know, different people that are going on the trip and Black Expats in, in general. But the Black Expats in Panama was what Chris and I came up with. I called them. I said, Chris, I'm looking at all these people on this page. I think we need to do a trip. I said, you down on doing a trip? And I said, and the trip needs to be, you know, of course, I got to bring that Black culture into it. And I said, but I'd like to show some people areas that's not Boquete and Coronado. You know, and at some point, I mean, we might do an, actually, I think we might be going to Coronado, but not Boquete. We ain't flying to Boquete, I promise. Um, but at some point, we may add that in and expand it. But, you know, initially, we wanted just to have a taste of Panama and to keep it close and tight. And, um, you know, I support my brother, Derek Lashley, at uh, Torre de Alba, Torre de Alba, downtown. Al and I, favorite hotel. It's like being at home. The customer service is amazing. The breakfast is amazing. And um, they're going to treat us good. And the thing, you stay at Torre when you come? Am I still talking? Yeah. You stayed at Torre de Alba? Oh, no, I haven't stayed there. Okay, because Torre de Alba is where most, a lot of uh, Black North Americans come to stay. So you see a lot of people from New York and New Jersey and Florida, and um, we just really, we just really like it. It's safe. Um, every every room is an apartment, you know. So it's like a full washer, dryer, refrigerator, stove, living room, dining room, and bedroom. Uh, me and Al, we have the penthouse, so. Uh, oh, okay. But, <laughs> but um, so it, it's going to be, it's going to be a blast. It is going to be a blast. So they can connect with us there, and uh, we're going to be doing them more regularly um, after this, too. So just okay. praying everything works with COVID. Um, we're hopeful that maybe by the spring, things will be letting up somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we can just get through February, we'll see. So when we set up the trip, we set it up so the cancellation is extremely lenient. I mean, I want to say it's a, a $300 deposit. And if you decide you ain't going, it's like $50. Um, you know what I mean? Processing fees. So because we understand that we're trying to make plans in the midst of uncertainty. But really what I feel about that, Alonzo, is like we just can't sit in a corner and wait, we no, gotta no. at least try to make reason. I mean, you can't be unreasonable. I think planning a trip, we were supposed to come back to Jan in, in Panama January for the second sister locked in Panama trip. I canceled that last March. You know, I was like, I don't think we're gonna be ready. But I do think that we have a chance of being more ready um, in May and definitely in July, um, in the July when we're going to um, Belize and ITA Global is taking all of the necessary precautions and following all of the COVID guidelines. And, you know, if we have to have two um, buses picking up people at the airport and things like that, we're going to work with whatever we need to work with. Okay. Thanks. So tell us more about uh, where people can find like um, Locks Forever. So I know you have your YouTube channel, which is 
All caps. Black Expats Channel too. Okay, go okay. ahead, clown me, Eliza. <laughs> what? No, I'm not. I'm talking. I'm trying to direct people to your business, though. Yeah, you may put some Black Expats stuff on there. I, but, you know, yes. As long as they can find you, the goal is for yes. them to be able to find you so that they can um, utilize your services. I appreciate that. Um, my uh, website is um, Locks. Lock, you could just Google Locks Forever. I'm gonna come up. And um, number four, right? Uh, yes, locks the people. forever. All right, that's right. Get me together. And actually, the website is locks dash four dash ever. Um, and locks forever. You know, the I'm, I'm much more active on my Facebook page. You can find me locks forever um, on Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram, and of course, my YouTube channel. I have a uh, podcast called Sisters Talking Natural Hair and Business that airs every Tuesday at 6 p.m. And so sometimes I video record those podcasts. They're uh, produced by Elite Conversations Live Talk Radio, but sometimes I put them on the YouTube. What I'm trying to do is separate things at this point because I just didn't know that the Black expats would become so... Yeah, you know, and so where I just, I mean, literally a majority of the followers at Locks Forever, full disclosure, are Black expats now. It's grown so much. People are so hungry for the information. But you can find me at Locks Forever um, everywhere. I answer all my inquiries. Uh, we do have a Panama uh, number, and then we can be reached in the U.S. Um, at 540-446-5107 as well. And I do respond to all inquiries, and I'm always happy to hear from everyone. Okay, sounds great. So what are the one or two main pieces of advice you would give to someone who's considering Panama as their expat destination? Because you got your page, I'm in a group with um, Black expats in Colombia and Ecuador, young expats in Panama, and all these different groups. People are really looking at it. They're weighing their options versus other countries. What are the one or two key pieces of advice you would give people that are looking at Panama? I would say start working on your Spanish now. You know, start working on your Spanish now. There are beautiful people here. There are lots of opportunities. Um, and it, that knowing Spanish, or at least some basic, you know, Spanish is going to make your transition that much easier. Things are going to be different on a lot of levels as it is. So make it easier on yourself and just start dealing with, you doing a little bit of Spanish. I, I, I uh, YouTube Spanish lessons and they have like some where you just go through and they do words, you know, and stuff like that. Figure out what's going to work for you. You don't necessarily have to buy a program. I've wasted my money on that. I'll say that. I've done Babel, I've done Rosetta Stone, and I could have just not done that, okay? I'm going to finally do uh, work with an instructor soon. Um, and then the second piece of advice that I would give to um, Pan anybody coming to Panama, it probably applies across the board going to other countries, is that my, my, um, my cousin here um, told me, he said, Cheyenne, that's my nickname, and he said, Everything you know about the United States, forget about it. He said, this is Panama. And that was life changing for me. So whereas even building the house, you know, you build your house and you're used to having light fixtures that, you know, even if they basic standard contractor light fixtures, you're used to having that when you come into the world. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. We close, walk through that door, and I'm like, we couldn't stay here if we wanted to. Wasn't a light in the joint. Wires you know, hanging out, right? It wasn't included. It's going to be all kind of stuff that catch you off guard. You know, when they asked you to, fit, to do a physical for a mortgage, you know, and you say, and then they tell you, we ain't giving you no mortgage past 70. You know, for us, for our, from our perspective, it was like, that's discrimination, <laughs> you know, but that's Panama. And so just open your mind and, and take some deep breaths and just remember that not everybody does things in the same way that they do whatever country you're coming from. And I think it'll make your transition a lot easier. And some great, great advice. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but we have a segment of the show called um, Echos Divertidos de Panama, which is fun facts 
of Panama. So one fun fact, just wanted to just share with you and everybody else is that Edward Murphy, who was a man that that coined, um, you know, Murphy, they talk about Murphy's Law, you know, anything can go wrong, will go wrong, was born in Panama, actually in 1918. Who knew that, right? But, um, so that's just- I did. That's a fun fact about Panama. And then um, we also have another segment called Panama Sabius, which is like, did you know? So Charlotte, did you know that the uh, Panama hat was actually not founded in Panama? It was founded in Ecuador. Did you know that? I definitely did. You know the hats, right? The, 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 the yes, pan- I know. I know the Panama oh, hat. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. So of there's course a- I didn't know that, but you know I didn't know it. I didn't know. <laughs> you know, um, I did. but but Eddie, but Murphy's law, he said whatever could go wrong would go wrong. And he was born in 1918. Wasn't that the year of the pandemic? Actually, you know what? Yeah, that pandemic was like 1916 to 1918. That was it was kind of like the tail end of it in 1918. Yeah, that probably had something to do with that, that. too, right? <laughs> But I had no idea. That's that's an interesting fact. Yeah, Thank you for the, sharing. Uh, on the Panama hat, though, yeah, there were people that moved from Ecuador. They started in Ecuador, and they migrated to Panama. In the 1850s, they started making it in Panama. They called it the Panama hat because they had way more sales and volume than they ever had in Ecuador. But they called wow. it the Panama hat because they came from Ecuador. Do so. you know if that hat is still, is it, is it popular in Ecuador as well? Yeah, now that I have no idea, but I can't wait to get there to find out. <laughs> you got it? At some point, yeah. Then Colombia's first, though, on our list is Colombia yes. first, and then we go from there. So um, We're going to do a trip to Cartagena. Oh, yeah, that sounds Cartagena. good. Cartagena. Mm-hmm. Keep me posted on that. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. what um, So we want to do, we want to thank you for joining us today, Charlotte, and we are going to... Um, Post all of Charlotte's information in the description, the Black Expats in Panama uh, Facebook link, the Black Expats Explore Panama tour information, the uh, Locks Forever website, so you can get in touch with Charlotte and the phone number that she listed. We'll list all of that in the description so that you can get in touch with her to take advantage of her services. We want to thank you so much, Charlotte, for joining us today. This has been so much fun. Thank you for letting me go on. Alonzo, you know you be keeping your interview short and sweet. That's all right, I'll break this <laughs> I had to be like a three part. I had to do a three part interview, three parts on this one. I've enjoyed right. it. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you're doing to bring awareness to um to Panama and the whole, you know, expat experience and just for the excellence in which you are doing it. Um, you know, and for you to be kind of new at this is absolutely unbelievable oh, you know you. how thank good you. of a job you're doing and oh my god you're following how did you do that i don't how know did you just put, we just following. Put, yeah we just put stuff like, yeah. the internet said alonzo is here and everybody's here nah, it's not like that now. that's not I'm you. Come on. i said man this boy is a superstar nah. Now that I have you on here, see, now that I have you on here, now it's going to blow up, see. Oh, thanks, Alonzo. So thanks for all that you're doing, though. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you. you Thank you, Thank sir. You. I appreciate yeah, it. See you soon. Look forward to meeting you in person. You and Same Alfredo here. in person. And take care. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.